It does not matter what you do, racing, jumping, dressage, or simply going out for a trail ride or hack. What matters is finding out how to communicate with the aim of producing a symbiotic relationship, a two-way connection between yourself and your horse. Welcome to the Horsemanship Breakthroughs podcast, a source for riding and training insights with the goal of helping your horse be a happy, light, and willing partner. I'm your host, Amalia Dempsey, a mainstream equestrian rider who discovered natural horsemanship, and now I help riders like you achieve connection and communication, so you can have more fun and fulfillment whilst prioritizing partnership with your horse. Want to find out my horse training philosophy? Access the free connection and communication mini course at amaliadempsey.com. Now sit back, relax, enjoy the show, and hit the subscribe button so you don't miss any future episodes. Welcome to the Horsemanship Breakthroughs podcast. This is episode eight. I made a little bit of an error in the last episode. I said it was episode eight. It was actually episode seven. This is episode eight, and I'm going to be doing something a little bit different today. I'm actually doing a book review. I'm a bit of a bookworm. I love reading books. I love studying, and especially when it comes to all things horses. And if you listen to my interview not long ago with Lynn Rusler, she spoke about this book in particular called Gallop to Freedom, Training Horses with Our Six Golden Principles by Frederick Pignon and Magali Delgado. So as soon as Lynn recommended this book, I jumped on it. I got on Amazon. I ordered it on Kindle um, and I loved it so much that I've actually ordered a hard copy as well. Um, so today what I want to do is go over my review of this book and share with you some insights and some takeaways that I got out of the book and hopefully you will read it too. It was one of these books that I was reading and the whole time I was like, yes, 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 this is what I like. This is what I want with my horses. And I have really just loved lately connecting with people and trainers all over the world that have similar principles and morals to me. So reading this book was really refreshing. And personally, I did go and watch the Cavalia show. So if you don't know much about Frederick and Magali, they are the creators of Cavalia, which is like this worldwide horse performance um, show that has just It's just incredible. If you haven't seen it, definitely Google it. Um, And if you get the opportunity to watch it in your own town, definitely go and watch it. It's just incredible. And I actually saw Cavalia when I was having a one year break from horses. And it's definitely one of the things that inspired me to get back into horses. And honestly, it was probably one of the first times that I saw things like Liberty and Liberty riding and Grand Prix dressage movements done with a beautiful, a beautiful quality of magic and lightness and kindness. So yes, it's really interesting how the universe has led me to this place, talking to Lynn and reading this book. And I've got something really exciting coming up. I've actually secured an interview with someone who works in Cavalia as a trainer. So you definitely have to stay tuned for that one. I'm so excited. I'm not going to tell you exactly who it is, but it's coming up on the pod. So more about Gallop to Freedom. Gallop to Freedom, the book by Frederick and Magali. So Frederick and Magali are a couple and they both come from slightly different backgrounds. I'm just going to read you a little bit about the um, summary of the book. So, uh, okay, in this remarkable book, now available in paperback, Frederick, specialist in liberty and groundwork, and Magalia, who's a talented dressage rider at the Grand Prix level, combine the efforts and share the secrets of the breathtaking relationships they have cultivated over the course of their lives with horses. They tell the story of Templado, the gorgeous but rebellious stallion who demanded they question all they had learned as horsemen and look at in a whole new light what it means to train horses. It was this tempestuous character that taught them that the process of building a relationship with a horse can be on more equal footing than most would dream possible. So I think a lot of us can relate to having that one horse that changes everything and changes the way that we look at training horses. It is with this life altering lesson in mind that Frederick and Magali now explain their six golden principles. This is what they outline in the book. These include how you can become a safe haven, the most important being in your horse's life, while ensuring he gets the leadership he craves and deserves, 
and how to establish acceptable limits of behavior as well as respect without ever succumbing to anger or using force. They describe how to read horse behavior so you can better understand and communicate with your equine partner as an individual. Plus, you'll see what it means to be patient and give your horse a say in his own training and just how rewarding the results can be. In a chapter devoted to their practical approach, you'll explore what is perhaps most central to their methods, the idea of play and how games can be used to develop a horse's intelligence, confidence and desire to perform, whether at liberty or in the most difficult of competitive environments. Magali shares the example of her Grand Prix Mount Deo, I think that's how you say it, with whom she has reached the pinnacle of European competition and whom dressage judges praise for his supple and stress-free performances. Both Frederick and Magali once thought they had become skilled and compassionate riders and trainers, but found that the monumental challenges presented by Templado turned their beliefs upside down and made them start again from the beginning. They now view their work with horses as a journey of endless discovery and infinite rewards. With this book full of phenomenal color photographs of their horses, many of whom appeared in the show that first made them famous, um, you can join and learn from them. I really, really love this book. And although this description kind of makes it sound like there is a lot of practical and step-by-step -step stuff in here, I didn't really find that. I didn't, I didn't find it was like a, um, educational book in that, Hey, try this exercise. It was more so about their philosophy with horses. So what I'd like to do is read you some of the highlighted sections. That, uh, I, that's what I love about Kindle. I can highlight different areas and then return back to it. So I'd like to go over some of the things that really stood out to me and really uh, resonated with me on a deeper level. So I'm obviously not going to read you out the whole book because I really want you to actually go away and read this book yourself because it's so beautiful. So um, I'm just going to read you little snippets that really resonated with me. So at the start, neither was formally taught and they came quite separately to the conviction that all training had to take place against a background of love and trust, that any progress based on domination or fear was pointless and unacceptable. I absolutely love this section because you know, I think so often in the horse industry, there's such a focus on being the horse's boss and making sure the horse is put in their place and all of that nonsense. But really, it should be on love and trust. And that's what we all want. Like, that's what the little girl inside of all of us really wanted with horses. And our horses are so beautiful. They're such amazing, beautiful creatures. Why do we have to be mean and angry at them? It shouldn't be like that. It should be based on love and trust, which is why I like that little quote so much. She, as in Magali, adheres strictly to her principles when training her horses. Respect for the horse is paramount and no force is used. The horse must agree to every move and happily so. And I love this as well because it tells me that Magali, who's the dressage rider out of the two of them, the relationship, um, she likes to make sure that she sticks to her principles. And I'm all about that as well. I mean, you know, sometimes we can deviate from them, but very quickly we can recognize when we're not being in alignment with who we really want to be around horses. And we can go back to strictly adhering to what our principles and philosophies are. So I love that as well. Frederick allows the horses to choose to a certain extent what they want to do. The freedom of choice is part of his training philosophy. He is never quite sure what they are going to come up with. And of course, the performances can vary according to the mood and ability of the horses performing on that night. Frederick has found that improvisation is important for keeping the horses in a relaxed and happy state. So I didn't know this, but in Cavalia, they, yes, obviously they have like an itinerary, I guess, or an outline as to what's going to happen in the show. But Frederick actually allows the horses lots of freedom to do kind of what they want in the show, which is really beautiful. And I think it's reflected in the expression of the horses because you don't really see any horses with their ears pinned back or kind of sour, which you can see in a lot, a lot of Liberty demonstrations. Um, so it's really nice to know that Frederick gives his horses the freedom to perform in the way that they want to, even in a setting such as Cavalia, where they've got an audience and they have to perform. And this resonates with me because often I will, in a way, like I have a plan for my training sessions, but if my horses are offering something that I want to play with, I will generally go with that. So quite often Harriet will come out and she's like, 
I want to try Spanish walk today. So I'm like, okay, it's Spanish walk day today. And we're, we're practicing on working on that. Um, so I can kind of make it a bit more of a conversation, a bit more of a, something that we're both collaborating on rather than me just dictating the whole time what we're going to do. So I really resonated with what Frederick, uh, how Frederick uh, performs and how he trains his horses, giving them a lot of freedom. Now, Frederick and Magali, they make no claims to having a particular system and they offer no specific techniques as such. What they do offer is an approach to understanding, to keeping horses, an approach that encourages a horse to explore and develop his own intelligence, and finally to give willingly to his owner as much as he is physically and mentally able when invited to do so. He is not under an obligation and it is therefore the opposite of achieving a state of submission. Now, I love this. It goes back to the whole, you know, no force used in training. But at the same time, I did find it a little bit misleading because I was like, guys, people need specific techniques and frameworks, especially when they're learning. Like these guys are very advanced and they probably operate off of feel quite a lot. So they don't necessarily have to think about what they're doing anymore. But I think it's important to know, whilst this is a beautiful, beautiful statement, I still think when you're learning, you do need to learn like a system or specific techniques so that you have a toolbox of things to choose from. Otherwise, if you're going, oh, well, the top riders, they don't use any specific techniques or or teach specific techniques, then you're going to be a little bit lost. Like, yes, overall, it is the philosophy and the approach and the mindset that underpins everything you do with horses. But I do think it's important that you have some skills, techniques and tasks Um, so yeah, that's sort of my thoughts on that. Frederick and Magali are convinced that the joy of mastery cannot be equated with the joy of achievement. When an animal gives to you as much as you give to him, one in which he chooses the speed at which you travel, in which he gives freely of his abilities. And why should he do this? Because in return, you relieve him of stress. He knows he will not be forced to do anything against his will and that you will protect him from danger and any situation that he does not understand. That is the bargain. So I love this little snippet because it talks about how you know, there is a lot of joy in what they do with their horses um, and they really respect their horses. They allow the horses to tell them when they're ready to do things. And the reason why their horses do perform is because they provide them with the relief of stress. They keep, they teach their horses that they can keep them safe. So I think that's really beautiful. What people do not appreciate is that every time a horse submits to pressure, whether subtle or overt, he is diminished. Probably the great majority of people who achieve their own ends by making their horse submit are not even aware of what they have done. It is a sad fact that a horse can be made to do many things by breaking his will. If he can be persuaded to give his assent freely and pleasurably rather than give in to man's pressure or clever techniques, he is not diminished. So yes, once again, goes back to one of their uh, overarching principles or approaches which is not to force the horse to do anything but to give the horse a lot of say and to keep it playful. This next part that I'm going to read out is related to if you've listened to my episode on 10 questions to help you solve any horse problem. I think it's episode two. Um, One of the points that I make is to use what your horse likes. So how can you make it easy for this horse? Um, and this point here, instead of saying to themselves as they had done so far, how can I get this horse to do what I want, albeit in the kindest way possible, they learn to ask, what would this horse like to do? Then slowly but surely, they built on what the horse told them. Instead of thinking as the, of themselves as teachers, they had to become pupils. So basically, this comes back to the whole listening to your horse and working with the horse that's in front of you. And, you know, if you are really honest with yourself, what would this horse really like to do and start there and build from that? And I think that relates back to one of the horses that they talk about um, within the book a lot, which changed their thinking about how they were doing everything with horses. This next part, oh my gosh, this, this quote almost needs to be on top of every single arena or training barn. It goes like this. It does not matter what you do, racing, jumping, dressage, or simply going out for a trail ride or hack. What matters is finding out how to communicate with the aim of producing a symbiotic relationship, a two-way connection between yourself and your horse. 
I absolutely love this quote. It's 100% what I'm all about. I read this and I was like, yes, yes, this is what the world needs to know. This is what the horse industry needs to know. A journalist once asked Frederick, is there anything you don't know about horses? To which he replied, the contrary is the case. I have only just begun to understand. The more you learn, the more you can share your knowledge and the more influence you can have. So I love that Frederick embraces the beginner mindset and I often find myself in this place. You know, people ask me for help. I give a lot of lessons. I have my online academy. But honestly, guys, I feel like I'm only just scratching the surface. There is so much to know about horses. We will never know enough in our lifetime. And the more you know, the more you realize you have no idea at all. So there is that paradox of we want to help people. We want to spread a good word. We want to you know, make sure that people are treating their horses kindly and training in a really nice way. Um, But at the same time, we're like, who am I to be teaching because I'm still learning from the horse. So it's just an ongoing journey. And I love that Frederick recognized that within the book. Frederick and Magali are not the masters of their horses. As they tell you on the pages that follow in their own words, they are their friends and guides. Roles are reversed. The horse whispers in their ears. He becomes the whisperer, which I love as well because, yes, it was, there's usually so much focus on us being the horse whisperers, quote unquote, and us, you know, training the horse, whereas really it's kind of the opposite. They say the roles are reversed. The horse is always teaching us. The horse is the master. Horsemanship was largely developed through military use, and many of the problems we have today are because of the attitude to horses that stems from this tradition. Riding skills had to be quickly taught, effective for the maximum number of people, uniform in application, and took little account of the feelings of the horse. And I see so much of the time people behaving in a certain way, a certain way around horses that is related to this initial horsemanship training for war right so you know in in war times if we ask the horse to do a certain thing we need them to do it straight away like no matter what I guess in those moments it doesn't really matter how the horse feels if you're trying to save your own life um so I guess that's where a lot of the kind of be your horse's boss attitude comes from And I've been in lesson situations before where people say, oh, well, you know, this is the way that everyone does it. And this is the way that, you know, I should be able to tell my horse to do what I want whenever I want and they should respond. And I'm like, well, yes, that comes from battle days, but I'm guessing that you've not entered any battles coming up. So you have the luxury to take the time and to listen to your horse and for it to be a two-way street rather than just a domination or having the horse submit to your cues 100% of the time. So yeah, I think it's kind of backwards for us to think about it coming from war times because we're not in those times. And even if we did have a war, we probably wouldn't be using horses. So we can kind of let that boat sink now. In our world, which is an artificial one for the horse, the horse needs to be given boundaries. When he is brought up in a herd, a horse learns social behavior and rules from other horses. In this case, I am only continuing the process when I take over. He has to integrate what I teach him, so the rules must be simple, precise, and coherent. A horse living a secure life is less stressed than the horse in the wild who is responsible for himself. And I love this little passage because... A lot of us, especially those of us who are really kind to our horses, who want the best for our horses, who want them to be happy, we tend to be the ones who don't like to be firm with our horses. We don't like to have clear boundaries in place because we feel mean. But by being the opposite, we're actually being more mean to our horses because they're craving that leadership and that safety and those boundaries from us. We, they really just want us to be clear with them in a non-mean way. So I love that they've highlighted this because often we can feel kind of bad and guilty about putting boundaries on our horses, but actually they're telling us, uh, Frederick and Magali are telling us that those boundaries are actually essential for a happy horse. Instead of substituting a new form of stress as an enforcer, we should take on the role of decider, not the one who imposes his will and dominates the horse. 
And herein lies a reason, possibly the most important reason, why we can persuade a horse to give us his trust and possibly his devotion. A horse seeks freedom from fear and stress above all else. Sugar lumps and carrots are not a sufficient substitute. So here, Frederick and uh, Magnoli are talking about the fact that, well, the horse is motivated by safety. The horse value safety above everything else and that's something that I talk about in the connection and communication mini course and inside my academy because yes I personally do use treats and they're a great motivator but unless your horse feels safe those things are not going to work quite often in my teaching I use parenting examples even though I'm not a parent yet well at least a human parent and uh, in the book they say a good parent will be to the child like a safe haven but will not want the child to remain in port all his life a good parent will respect the child and in turn hope to earn the respect of the child so it is with the horse so it is with the horse only we do not have the ability to communicate by word of mouth we of course can use words and tones of voice but the horse cannot this is no doubt the reason why man has so easily resorted to enforcement in his dealings with horses rather than meeting the challenge of learning their language And my friends, that is the language of body language, which is what horses use with each other. So it makes sense for us to use that with our horses as well, but we need to show our horses what our body language means. A horse seems to know whether our minds are concentrated on what we are asking him to do. It is one of the gifts that a horse makes to us. He drives home the importance of concentration. I was helping one of my lovely students the other day with a horse who is a little bit distracted and we're working on relaxation and anxiety with them. And she was saying how he just doesn't really focus on me. And what I actually observed was she wasn't actually fully focused on her horse. So this point inside the book really highlights that because we need to be 100% hyper aware and concentrated on our horse if we expect the same of them to us. I am not a predator like the wolf, nor am I an alpha horse who would in the wild rule by fear and create stress. I feel that my parent-child description is possibly the closest parallel. So here they're talking about you know, how they see their relationship with their horses. And I really like the parent-child description because a parent is a child's friend, but also their leader. I talk about being your horse's cheerleader, but I also talk a lot about parenting. So I love that they also mention this in their book. Um, So yeah, I do kind of have a little bit of a funny feeling about the whole dominating a horse. Um, It's probably because of the language around it. It kind of suggests that you are uh, kind of forcing the horse to do what you want and you're being this kind of dominant being in their life. Whereas that parent-child description or relationship to me feels much nicer in terms of describing the way a relationship should be with your horse. The longer I live in the company of horses, the more I feel my ability to communicate with other humans deepens and the more I appreciate the need for respect, not to judge too easily, to be tolerant, to have compassion and acceptance. That is the horse's gift to me. And guys, I found this so much on my own horsemanship journey as well. The better I can be with horses, the better person I am as well. It really is a self-development journey. So I love that they also pointed this out. I take into account a horse's mental and physical traits before I decide on my approach to the exercises and the playing we will do together. In case it is not already clear, what I mean by playing is that I create a relaxed atmosphere of enjoyment and fun. Each horse may need a slightly different approach to achieve this state, which is essential to success, but the principles are the same. The horse makes signals with every part of his body. I have to learn to read his thoughts by watching his nostrils, his ears, his eyes, and his general attitude. His eyes are particularly important to learn to read because they are like an opening through which I can see what is going on inside his head. He is telling me with subtle signals how he feels. This is something I feel so strongly about as well, and I find it's the bulk of what I teach my students because you need to learn how to understand your horse. You need to try and interpret what your horse is telling you with their body so you can then decide what to do. Our horses are always communicating with us and on how they feel and what they're thinking about. We just have to be open-minded and educated enough to know what it is they're telling us. 
What I can say to you is watch out for all these indications. Allow your instincts to tell you what your senses observe. At this point, you may throw up your hands and say that this is all too ambiguous and too much to learn, but you have already learned to do the do all these things with other people, with humans. When you meet with someone, you know well after you have been apart for a time. Can't you see in an instant when something is wrong? Why should reading a horse not be similar? So I love that he's point this, he points this out because we can so easily read humans because we've been taught to and we have had a lot of experience dealing with other humans. It can be the same with horses in that we can work out what our horse is telling us if we just simply open our minds and observe. And guys, once you learn to do this, it's actually not that ambiguous. It's actually extremely obvious. You know, I see things and it's so, so obvious to me. It's almost like, do I point this out? Because it seems like everyone should know and see this, but it's really not common sense. But that's the thing, guys. Common sense is actually usually not very common. If the pressure is violent and painful, the horse may well do as you bid, but he is doing so because he has given in. He appears to obey, but like a person surrendering information under torture, he has been cowed and his reactions blunted. Oh, guys, I feel so strongly about this really sad passage from the book because it's so true, you know, and um, without, you know, being completely... Uh, I guess, offensive. I feel like some horses have this look on their face as if they're almost being raped. Like, and, and, they've, and they've realized they can't actually get out of the situation. So they simply just accept it and get on with it, which oh, must just be so awful for some horses. And it's moments like these in the book that I just go, yep, yep, I've thought about that. Yes, it, that's exactly how I'm thinking. So Yeah, I just, I've really, really enjoyed reading this book. Instead of trying to force him into a state of submission, I invite him to cooperate. Whatever happens, I must not get into an argument with him. I must find a way to be firm without fighting. You have to convince him that it is better to stay with you, although that is not to say he is forbidden to leave. Every step in our relationship with a horse must be achieved within a code of practice that does not permit punishment, cruelty, or compulsion. I hope that, at the very minimum, you turn away from these pages with an unshakable respect for horses and a determination to treat them with consideration. I hope this book also leads to a resolve to gain the horse's confidence, to be honest and open, to try and understand whether the horse likes what you are doing with him, and to ask yourself if you are doing something for your convenience or the horse's interests, to channel all instruction through enjoyment, to strive to develop the horse's intelligence and initiative, and to learn to watch and listen and thereby develop your own powers of observation. Oh, I'm going to leave you with that little passage in this beautiful book, Gallop to Freedom. I highly recommend it. I really enjoyed it. It did not take me long to read at all, and I think it's an absolute must read. If you guys really like or if you liked today's episode and you want me to do more book reviews on different horsemanship books, I'm happy to do that. You can even send me some recommendations. Just send me a message on Instagram at Amalia underscore horses. And yeah, like I said, I absolutely love reading books on horsemanship. So I'm excited to bring you more episodes like this in this format. I hope you have a great day. I hope you got a lot out of today's episode and I hope you take this review and buy Gallop to Freedom on Amazon or a hard copy and read it and let me know what you think as well. Thanks for listening to the Horsemanship Breakthroughs podcast. Make sure you hit subscribe so you get notified every time a new episode is released. And if you've learned even just one small thing from today's show, I would really appreciate if you could leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. If you have any questions from today's show, suggestions for future episodes, or just want to reach out and say hi, I would love to connect with you on Instagram at Amalia underscore horses. Remember to also register for my free connection and communication mini course at AmaliaDempsey.com.